thought before um, introducing our next two speakers, that it would be a good idea to let you know um, how they and all the rest of our speakers actually came to be here today. Um, this is the 36th annual conference on administrative law that the journal has held. And um, we were working to choose a topic right around the time that Kas Katrina struck the Gulf Coast. Um, Jeff Goldman, one of our article, uh, sorry, executive editors, um, suggested that we actually focus on Katrina and more broadly on the administrative law issues involved in disaster preparedness and response. And sort of the more we thought about that, the more that it seemed like a great idea. Um, there are obviously a lot of different issues as shown by the papers here today. And to sort of get at those, we decided to take a different approach to um, sort of pulling people into the conference rather than just inviting a series of people and having them write papers afterwards. So what we did was put out a call for papers. We received over five dozen proposals um, for entry into our sort of submission contest, I guess you could say. Um, and then through a sort of long process of reading all of these, um, we narrowed it down to five. Um, and those are the five papers being presented today. Um, thanks to all the hard work of um, journal members this year and last year, um, they will actually hopefully be published on time in um, the October issue of the journal. Um, so with all of that said, um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Schmalbeck and Professor April. Professor Schmalbeck, uh, I'm sorry, is it April? April, I'm sorry. Um, professor Schmalbeck, as you know, is a um, professor here at Duke, and Professor April um, is joining us from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, um, where she's also an associate dean, I believe. Um, and they'll be discussing um, tax policy. Please welcome. Okay, they're, they're setting up the, uh, the AV here. Well, um, thanks, Adam, and uh, the DLJ for having me here. Uh, of course, having me here is uh, an extremely inexpensive decision for the uh, DLJ, uh, but uh, the presence of a co-author from the other end of the continent helps uh, deflect the inference that uh, this choice among the 25 entrants was unduly influenced uh, by uh, the budget. Um, in fact, Ellen and I divided up the work pretty much 50-50, and in thinking about how to divide up the presentation, uh, the sort of uh, natural uh, division of labor seemed to be to uh, divide it up according to the parts we uh, each initially written. So I'm going to uh, begin by some, some kind of general uh, framing remarks and then talk about um, the two major pieces of legislation that followed uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, she's going to turn to then uh, some detail from an earlier uh, disaster, uh, the 9-11 disasters, and talk about the similarities in the legislative response to that, uh, and then uh, continue with um, some remarks about the role of sympathy uh, in tax legislation, uh, some of the distributional effects uh, of the particular choices made in the legislation, and uh, a little bit about some of the institutional mechanisms that we might uh, consider to try and um, improve the the quality and, and perhaps uh, lessen the frequency of this kind of, uh, of legislation. Um, okay. Great. That's not what I want. Oh. Okay. Uh, the fact is that uh, major disasters in the last uh, several years uh, have spawned uh, major pieces of tax legislation as well. And that wouldn't be uh, inherently problematic, uh, but the problem is really that the, uh, the legislative uh, output is uh, not very good. Uh, the quality is, uh, is, is uh, um, quite problematic. Uh, they tend not to work very well as disaster relief, and uh, primary reasons for that is that the legislative process itself is not built for speed, so it takes uh, Congress a while uh, to uh, figure out what they want to do. Um, but also the, uh, the form of the relief uh, is, tends to be slow. It's, uh, it's dispensed uh, in a way that's typically manifest in the form of a lower tax liability, uh, the benefits of which are received at some indefinite uh, point in the future, and of course uh, only received by people who have tax liability to relieve uh, for the most part. Uh, maybe a few exceptions to that, but uh, the tax system 
uh, works best at relieving uh, tax liabilities where they already exist, and that's uh, not uh, comprehensive. Um, so they don't work very well as disaster relief. Uh, they tend not to be uh, particularly effective uh, as instruments of, of good tax policy either. And uh, I want to talk just briefly about two primary uh, tax policy criteria uh, that they tend not to uh, well serve. Uh, and then there are others, uh, at least a couple of which will be uh, touched on by, uh, by Ellen. Uh, the first is horizontal um, equity. Uh, and uh, horizontal equity, for, for those who are not uh, familiar with the way that term is used in uh, tax policy, refers generally to treating similarly situated taxpayers uh, similarly. Uh, so uh, in this kind of context, what we're really talking about is uh, something like this. If the wind blows down a tree and the tree destroys your car, uh, maybe we should allow some sort of tax relief uh, as a response to that uh, unfortunate disaster. Uh, but if we do, we should do that on more or less similar terms, uh, whether the wind in question was part of a big hurricane or a small hurricane or just a, uh, a stiff breeze. Uh, the fact is uh, your car was destroyed uh, suddenly and, and uh, um, in, in ways that caused you economic damage, and uh, whether the wind in question was, uh, was part of a big disaster or not doesn't really matter to the victim very much. Uh, vertical equity generally uh, uh, speaks of, of sort of the, the, the way we distribute tax burdens uh, vertically along the, uh, an income or wealth scale. Um, and there's, there's uh, vertical equity is, is uh, a, a question on which a lot less uh, uniformity of view uh, is, is seen. Um, there are people who believe our tax system should be quite progressive, people who believe it should be slightly progressive. Uh, there aren't very many people who believe that it should be uh, regressive. Uh, so I, I think you could say that vertical equity involves, at a minimum, not treating wealthy taxpayers better than we treat less wealthy taxpayers. Uh, but unfortunately, many of the tax disaster relief provisions uh, do suffer this tendency, and it will mostly be uh, Ellen who uh, illustrates some of those effects. Uh, a pattern we're, uh, that seems to be emerging in, in recent years is, is a systematic tendency uh, for Congress to, uh, to overreact. And uh, I can sharpen that sense of overreaction a little bit by noting that um, the pieces of legislation that uh, we've looked at uh, basically involve provisions that could be put into uh, uh, one of uh, three categories. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot this slide. Uh, this, this is, uh, Ellen's going to uh, elaborate on this a little bit. I've talked about horizontal equity and vertical equity. She's going to talk a little bit about the distributional impact, which is sort of a subcategory of vertical equity. There are also efficiency concerns, uh, and uh, those, those have to do with the incentive effects that uh, particular pieces of legislation uh, uh, induce. And uh, in particular, uh, there are some concerns about the incentive effects uh, as to uh, people's willingness to uh, uh, privately finance uh, insurance uh, if there is a sort of uh, de facto public insurance that may be available at the back end. Okay, um, three types of uh, disaster tax provisions. Uh, these, this, this list is obviously uh, not, uh, not one that Congress created, it's uh, our categorization. Uh, there are measures that are reasonably tailored to the needs created by the disaster. Uh, and these, unfortunately, are rare. Uh, and then the third one, measures that make no sense on any reasonable grounds. And those are, unfortunately, not as rare as you'd like them to be. Uh, but both are, are relatively rare compared to the ones in the middle. Uh, what, what we find in this legislation are mostly measures that could be defensible if looked at just in, in by themselves. Uh, but do tend to create these horizontal inequities. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, represent uh, uh, tax choices that might be reasonable, but only if offered uh, to uh, uh, the full range of uh, similarly situated victims. And they tend not to be. They tend to be targeted at a particular subcategory. So it's, uh, I think, only slightly uh, oversimplifying to say that uh, most of this recent tax disaster le uh, legislation produces rules that provide uh, some relief to people who, who might be among the taxpayers who deserve a break. Uh, but if they are, they're only a subset of all taxpayers deserving uh, a similar break. You, you could even say that um, taxpayers who, who live in the line of fire of a major disaster are 
uh, lucky, but I recognize I'm using that in a kind of intensely relative way. They've, <laughs> after all, been victimized by a disaster. But they were lucky enough to uh, be uh, victimized by a spectacular disaster uh, and then will be better treated, typically, than people who suffer uh, a similar misfortune but suffer it in quiet obscurity. Uh, okay, well, why does this happen? Uh, in the working title of the paper uh, that uh, some of you have seen, uh, we talk about uh, a, an action imperative that Congress apparently feels. And we don't know for sure exactly why this is, and I've speculated on it a little bit. We actually, in the history of the American tax system, haven't seen that much of this kind of thing. Um, and I was just trying, it's just in thinking about why that is. So one of the things that seems to be true is that there was a kind of wave of huge disasters just before we had an income tax. And maybe if, maybe if the history had uh, been different, uh, just slightly, uh, as to that chronology, that wouldn't be the case. But toward the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, what do we have? We had the Chicago fire, uh, the San Francisco earthquake, uh, the Galveston hurricane was in the early part of the 20th century, wiped out uh, thousands of uh, lives, uh, the sinking of the Titanic. All these things happened really just before we had an income tax. So obviously the income tax didn't occur as a uh, solution. Uh, the one that, uh, that I can think of that is uh, uh, post-1913, uh, when the uh, modern income tax was added to the um, federal code, uh, was the sinking of the Lusitania, which bears some, some resemblance to the 9-11 uh, situation, I think. Uh, but uh, that was 1915, and uh, the tax system was relatively new, the rates were very low, and there wasn't really much leverage to be had through the tax system. I kind of went through, I literally went through a world almanac looking at disasters, and uh, you find them in, you know, uh, earthquakes in Turkey wipe out tens of thousands of people, and tsunamis, and, and so on, but uh, we've been lucky uh, in the U.S. There have been relatively few uh, disasters, uh, or even um, uh, acts of war uh, that have uh, uh, wiped out significant numbers of, uh, of civilians. So we haven't had too many of these, but um, and, and so maybe, and this, is, this would be kind of a, uh, a hopeful thought, maybe, maybe uh, these uh, tax legislation acts are isolated phenomena, uh, just as the disasters that produce them are isolated phenomena. Um, but one fears not. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, it's just uh, the reality that probably terrorism is uh, going to be with us for a while. Uh, and uh, there's even um, a suggestion in the climate change literature that uh, one of the aspects of the climate change is that catastrophic events are going to be more frequent and more severe. So both on the natural and the, on the unnatural disaster side, we may have more of them. Plus, once Congress has, begun, uh, has, has become habituated to responding to these with tax legislation, uh, it becomes more difficult to resist the, uh, the imperative the next time around. Uh, and, and one fears in particular that this may become a feature of modern politics uh, in the U.S., another manifestation of, of bad government in response to the 32nd uh, campaign ad, uh, a generic form of which we can just see here. Uh, this is everybody's nightmare uh, as they're sitting in Congress. They imagine the next ad saying, uh, hard-hearted, uh, your name here. Uh, why, he even voted against tax relief for the victims of disaster name here. Uh, and then the talk shows uh, talk about... Uh, why does he hate the American taxpayer? What's, uh, what's wrong with him? So uh, this is very difficult legislation to vote against uh, once it is proposed. Uh, so um, there's every reason to think that there's going to be, I think, more and more of this uh, in response to disasters. And one of the problems is that uh, Congress isn't really subject to much constraint in this area. Uh, it's constrained, obviously, by the Constitution. Uh, but as every tax lawyer knows, uh, the Constitution turns out to be mu not much of a constraint at all uh, as a general matter, and, and certainly not a con serious constraint uh, in situations like these. Um, Congress is also, I think, uh, and here's, here we see the beginnings of maybe a little bit of a solution. Um, and I guess I, I, we, we think a, a fair amount in this paper about what some of the solutions might be. And none of them is a sort of drop-dead solution. Uh, you know, I mean, what, part of the solution is just to point out how bad the legislation is, and, and uh, we try to do that. But of course, that's the thought that uh, academic criticism is going to uh, uh, make a huge change is, is uh, um, the kind of uh, uh, remedy you don't want to hold your breath waiting to uh, see the effects of. So uh, it's not the only thing. But one of the things that we think might be promising 
is to expand uh, some of the authority of the IRS. Uh, because uh, part of the congressional imperative reflects the fact that the IRS is excessively constrained. Uh, Congress may not be constrained enough, but the IRS is too constrained. The IRS generally has no authority to waive the usual operation of the tax laws. Uh, so uh, possibly thinking about various ways that we could expand the IRS uh, authority uh, may be helpful. Well, once Congress gets into the act, one of the questions is, uh, why tax legislation? Um, you noticed in the previous uh, example of the previous paper, uh, tax legislation really didn't come up at all. It's not the first thing you think of when there are people who are uh, homeless or uh, in danger of floodwaters or um, things of that sort. Um, and we, we've uh, thought a little bit about this. So one of the things is just sort of one of the political realities of the organization of our Congress, uh, which is that the Senate Finance Committee and the uh, House Ways and Means Committee are powerful committees. Um, the, they tend to have uh, um, a, a non-random selection of uh, the members of the two houses on them, uh, the, the non-randomness being that they tend to be among the more powerful uh, senators and congressmen. Uh, and uh, there are also some perceptions about uh, tax uh, uh, relief measures uh, that seem superficially appealing. Uh, probably wrong, but they seem appealing. And, and what, uh, I need to explain just maybe a little bit for some members of the audience this notion of a tax expenditure. Uh, it's not a really very complicated notion. The, the idea is that if you provide tax relief through some uh, change in the rules, you uh, uh, reduce revenue, and uh, reduction of revenue is not terribly different than actually appropriating funds uh, to accomplish the same purpose. It's a sort of uh, uh, negative appropriation uh, of a sort. And uh, these are usually not good things, uh, they, they, uh, because it's uh, somewhat harder to control the beneficiaries, uh, somewhat harder to achieve uh, tight uh, targeting on the problem. Uh, the idea of tax expenditures uh, came into being, was introduced uh, into the, the lexicon of legislation, uh, really by people who thought that they were mostly a bad thing. Uh, that's not invariably true, but, uh, but there is a sort of uh, sense of doubt about it. But um, that, that has come to, to uh, change a little, I think, in recent years. Uh, and, and Congress doesn't seem to believe that tax expenditures are really quite like appropriated expenditures. You can even, if you, if you kind of look closely a little bit between the lines of a lot of uh, campaign rhetoric in recent years, you can find some members of Congress that are, are thinking of creation of tax expenditures as a tax cut, as though this were actually you know, a rate cut, which would be a kind of unambiguously good thing rather than the bad thing uh, it typically is in reality. Uh, and um, so uh, there's a perception somehow that they're not as costly as uh, appropriated expenditures, but that's, uh, that's simply wrong. Uh, they are every bit as costly and usually not, uh, not as well targeted. There's also a perception that somehow uh, they, they involve uh, the bureaucracy less, and that's, uh, that's a sort of uh, uh, theme that, uh, that one hears uh, increasingly. Uh, they, they, it is true that tax expenditures are effectuated by, by volitional acts of taxpayers. You have to do something in order to take advantage uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the tax expenditure. Um, and, and they seem then sort of self-executing and not dependent on the acts of some bureaucrat. And that's, that is not completely untrue, but it's somewhat misleading. And in particular, the IRS, uh, as a general matter, has to make rules governing uh, the tax expenditure. So, so much of what goes on is actually a switch uh, in a switch from an appropriated tax, uh, sorry, in a switch from an appropriated expenditure to a tax expenditure, what you are often doing is simply trading one bureaucracy for another, uh, and not actually uh, achieving this uh, goal of uh, of getting the government bureaucrats uh, out of your hair. Um, well, let's look at a, a few uh, specific examples. Uh, first, from the uh, the hurricane legislation, and then uh, Ellen will describe, as I said, the legislative response to the 9/11 terrorist attacks. Um, Congress uh, managed to, uh, to put together a tax relief bill following Hurricane Katrina in, in pretty remarkable speed by the standards of uh, tax legislation. Uh, they got it together within about a month uh, of the hurricane itself. But unfortunately, just as the bill was being signed, uh, Hurricane Rita was making uh, landfall off the Gulf Coast again. Uh, and a month later, Hurricane Wilma uh, drew a, a little circle around the Gulf of Mexico, finally hitting the uh, west coast of Florida.
So they passed the one bill, uh, the Ketra bill that we refer to in our um, uh, paper, uh, and then uh, later passed uh, another bill uh, that um, involved uh, uh, expanding the geographic scope uh, of the relief provisions and uh, adding uh, a few additional um, investment incentives and, and things of that sort. Uh, and, and I want to digress here just a little bit uh, for this reason. I think the inclusion of geographic areas affected by uh, Hurricanes Rita and Wilma uh, is, is really very revealing when you think about it. Uh, these were serious hurricanes, um, but, but nothing like Katrina. Uh, Katrina, just, just to, uh, the, the, the latest numbers I've seen are that uh, there are over 1,600 deaths uh, from Katrina, and they seem to still be finding uh, bodies, so I don't think we have the final count yet. Uh, and uh, probably at least $75 billion worth of damage. Uh, Rita and Wilma uh, did not kill as many as, as uh, uh, 10 people uh, each. Uh, and uh, the, the property damage was considerable, but less than 10% of the property damage of Katrina. Um, but here's why it's revealing. The, the, what, what, what had happened is that I think Congress realized at some level uh, that there was no principled basis for distinguishing between victims of one of these hurricanes and victims of another. Uh, that if your house was destroyed by a hurricane, it didn't really matter that much which name was on that hurricane. Uh, and uh, that recognition is what we basically would like to dawn on Congress more generally, uh, that for the most part, disasters are disasters, and it doesn't matter uh, very much to the affected taxpayer uh, how broad or widespread the, this was. So if, uh, if relief is available for damage from Katrina, then it should be available for damage from Rita and Wilma, surely, but uh, also for similar sorts of damage. Uh, no matter what the cause. Um, so it's, it's really the, the, uh, the kind and amount of destruction that matters and not, uh, not the precise cause. Well, our paper has uh, several examples drawn from uh, KETRA and, uh, and the later um, um, act that we acronym uh, GOZA. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm running out of my time here. Let me just give one quick example. Um, the background rules regarding casualty loss deductions are that uh, they are only deductible um, to the extent that they exceed a 10% floor. Uh, and uh, that's a very serious limitation on deductibility. Uh, Congress put that into the code in 1982 uh, and uh, effective for the following year. And in 1982, uh, about 2 million people claimed casualty losses, and in 1983, about 200,000. So, so this, uh, this change to add a 10% of uh, adjusted gross income threshold uh, eliminated about 90% of the casualty loss deductions. But now, uh, if the casualty loss was within the geographic zones uh, defined by these acts, it is wholly deductible without respect to the 10% uh, adjusted gross income floor. Uh, uh, further, a uh, taxpayer in the effective zone, affected zone is uh, allowed to withdraw funds from a 401k uh, or other similar retirement account uh, to pay for the repairs uh, without the usual premature withdrawal penalties uh, of 10% that would apply to that. Uh, also, withdrawals from 401k plans are typically fully taxable. Uh, but again, uh, in the case of uh, people in the hurricane zones, uh, you can make these withdrawals uh, without uh, any tax liability at all, as long as you're in a position to repay the funds uh, to the plan within three years. Uh, so you may be able to uh, make this withdrawal, uh, pay for the repairs, uh, gradually restore the funds to your plan, uh, and uh, uh, also take the deduction for the, for the loss, uh, which is remarkably favorable treatment. We run some numbers uh, in our paper about uh, uh, the effect on a couple of hypothetical taxpayers, uh, one of whom has uh, a loss of this sort within one of the hurricane zones and another who lives in Minnesota or something and just has uh, a strong wind uh, do the same amount of damage uh, to, uh, to his home. Uh, so there really just isn't much uh, uh, reason for that kind of uh, selectivity among victims based on just how big the disaster was. But there are, we recognize, some differences in, in the scope of disasters like Katrina that may have salience for tax relief provisions. And that, that's what constitutes that first category, the category that I said was, was uh, 
uh, appropriate responses and uh, responses that we should admire. And we do have some examples of those as well. And, and again, I'll just give you one uh, here and, and then turn it over to, uh, to Ellen. But um, there, there is a, a provision of the code that allows taxpayers basically not to recognize uh, gains they might have on destroyed property. You might wonder, how do you get a gain on a destroyed property? Well, if uh, the property has appreciated in value and you have it uh, insured for something approaching its market value, uh, if it's then destroyed, that is presumptively a taxable event uh, where you would be paid, uh, you would be assessed tax on the gain, the amount by which the insurance recovery exceeds your original investment uh, in that asset. But you can avoid being taxed on that gain if you reinvest those proceeds in, in similar property uh, within two years. And that's part of the background uh, tax provisions. Well, two years is probably the right amount of time uh, for somebody who suffers an isolated disaster because it shouldn't be that hard to find the replacement property within an area that's still economically functioning and intact. Um, but if the, if the property was in New Orleans, for example, two years may not be enough time. It's going to take longer than that to rebuild the infrastructure. So extending the time length uh, that, uh, within which that reinvestment can occur uh, is a very sensible response to the sort of widespread disaster uh, that was uh, associated with Katrina. Now, Congress actually had already changed the background tax rules on that uh, by extending the two-year period to four years uh, if uh, the destruction resulted from a presidentially declared disaster. Uh, and what uh, the, uh, the Ketra Goza uh, addition to that is, is to add another year. Uh, whether another year is uh, enough and makes sense uh, could be debated, but, but the general idea of tinkering with those kinds of provisions uh, to reflect the effects of very widespread uh, disasters that may make things like replacing property difficult uh, does seem like a good thing. Uh, let me turn it over now to, uh, to Ellen. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to the 9-11 disaster like at least one other paper in the conference does. And we think it makes a very interesting contrast between the two kinds of disasters in part, the natural and as Rich called it, the unnatural disaster. The other thing we have wondered about is at least for tax, whether any of this would have happened without 9-11. That 9-11 was seen as unique, something Congress had to respond to, other terrorist disasters had not gotten that kind of tax relief. Lockerbie got a little bit, but nothing like this. Others hadn't. So they did it for 9-11, made it sound as if it was unique, as if it were unique. And then another disaster comes along, and they respond to that as well. So we do wonder if the 9-11 disaster, in part, opened the storm gates, the floodgates that we saw with the actual floods. So what they did in 9-11, very similar to what happened with the hurricanes, is first give individual relief and then follow with relief that was more corporate and business. For the Victims of Terrorism Tax Relief Act, what they did was give these victims the same thing they gave to soldiers. I never knew about these soldiers' provisions until I did this research for this paper, and most tax people did not know that we had given this kind of relief to the victims of 9-11. When I talked to people about it, they were quite surprised. Just as Rich said, we tagged along with some hurricanes. They started doing it for 9-11 and said, oh gosh, maybe we'd better do it for the anthrax victims too. And Oklahoma City got in there as well, and only Oklahoma City. We haven't tracked down all the legislative history. I think people jumped up and down and said, we were victims of domestic terrorism, but we were victims in the same way. The question of horizontal equity again, which ones do we do it? This bill passed the House in two days. It took several months to actually get signed. The big debate was with the Senate whether people who did not have income tax relief, who would get very little, what would they do for them? It's again part of this whole theme, hard to give the poor any tax relief. Senate wanted to give payroll tax relief. For most, many Americans, Rich, you know the percentage, their payroll, their social security liability, Larry might know, is higher than their income tax liability. House wouldn't go along with giving payroll tax relief to these victims. Ultimately, they said, you get at least $10,000 relief. Even if you don't have income tax liability, we will write you a check. 
so that your total relief will be $10,000, and that's the only way they got both houses to agree. All of the legislative history is that we are now at war with terrorists. We should be treat these people the same way we treat our brave soldiers. If you look at the impact of this relief for soldiers, they don't make very much. They don't have a state tax liability. In the tax expenditure budget, it's a little asterisk. It can't even register at all. So something that was perhaps more symbolic for soldiers was extended to these kinds of victims. And the victims of 9-11 in particular were unusually wealthy. I was very glad to go right to this report of the special master and got just the chart. I said, there must be an income chart, and there was. So you can see exactly how they compare in where their incomes are to where most Americans are, much less soldiers. And what they end up getting is no income tax for the year of death and the year before, and an astonishingly lower estate tax. Much different schedule. And a lot of the people, yeah, a lot of the people in the 9-11 in particular would have had substantial estate tax. Um, think of the Cantor Fitzgerald people. Uh, think of someone which says, if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett had been at Windows on the World the day before 9-11, and then they walked away fine, no impact on their estate tax. But if for some reason they had been there the day that it happened and were a 9-11 victim, we would lose a very lot in estate tax. And those of us who support the estate tax think it's very important to vertical equity and to progressivity. Now, the victims of 9-11, not the others, also did get large tax-free awards from the Victims' Compensation Fund. The average award was $1.3 million in the Victims' Compensation Award, and it was a total of $7 billion. So that would have been tax-free under other provisions regardless of this additional income tax relief. So we get the income tax relief to individuals, and then a few months later, we finally get some business incentives as part of the Job Creation and Workers Assistance Act. Again, couldn't get this in time to do it with the Victims Tax Relief Act. It included things you often see when we try to give geographic incentives, tax-exempt bonds, extra depreciation, <coughs> small business expending, five-year replacement period, a work opportunity credit. And here our question is largely an efficiency question. Did Lower Manhattan need it? A targeting kind of issue. Would it have been rebuilt without it? How much did we spend government funds that were dead weight lost because this would have happened without it? Nonetheless, as with the hurricane provisions, there are some things we think could be models. One of the things they did in the Victims Tax Relief Act is greatly expanded the authority of the Secretary of the Treasury to extend deadlines for various tax filings. You know, you have nothing there. It's really hard to file your taxes, make your payments. This was very useful when the hurricanes came almost immediately afterwards. Another provision excluded qualified disaster relief payments from income, not only presidentially declared, but the Secretary of Treasury declared disasters, and he has, in particular, for US citizens who were tsunami or the South Asian earthquake. So this is a provision that, again, was more general. And so they went beyond particular disasters, and they both allowed quick administrative response. And part of the reason I am particularly pleased to be here is I think it's good to remember that the IRS is an administrative agency, and having it as part of this conference helps us to remind that. And I've done a lot of the work in my career on that intersection, so it's particularly nice. Part of, as Rich said, what we see is we have such tremendous sympathy for these particular victims. And that public pressure was to help these victims that we all felt so strongly for, and particularly 9-11 first, and not victims generally. Remember what happened to the Red Cross when they said we have enough money for these victims of 9-11? There is other people who have great, there are other people who have greater needs absolute storm of protest 
Red Cross had to back down. We had sympathy for these victims. We put ourselves in their place, whether they were rich or poor. Indeed, the sympathy is powerful today. I did a trial run of this paper in our tax policy class, and the students were horrified that I would dare to suggest that any of the 9-11 victims should not get our sympathy and tax relief. They said, better to have bad sympathy than no sympathy at all. It's just such a strong sense that this hit us as well, and we should do something for them. So sympathy can have some unfortunate policy results. And this sympathy was very much geographically based, especially the business ones. What e evidence we have, what experience we have with geographically targeted incentives is not very good. There's very little evidence that it works and probably even less for natural and unnatural disasters instead of low level poverty relief. All the tax policy wonks argued till they were blue in the face to Congress about this at the time, and Congress ignored it, so that doesn't give us much hope that we will persuade Congress any differently, but it's part of what happens here. As we've said, the other effect, if you try to deliver this through the tax code, is that it tends to help the wealthy more, either advertently or inadvertently, and we're trying to stay agnostic on the point, although we're having a hard time staying agnostic. You have to have income to benefit from income tax relief for the most part. As I said, it was a big fight to get even $10,000 of relief to the poor victims of 9-11. Uh, we have to run some sort of scenarios for how much relief it was for some of the richer victims. In the hurricane relief, they tried to give some earned income tax credit relief. The provisions are so complicated and depend on records that these people will not have that it probably is not much use. President Clinton's foundation has just announced a major campaign to try to get some people to get some of the earned income tax credit relief because it's so difficult otherwise. These geographical tax benefits generally are going to help those with capital to invest. It's a trickle-down kind of theory. And in particular, when you look at how the estate tax relief for 9-11 was described, it was all relief from the death tax, part of that whole campaign to eliminate the estate tax. It was put into that context. Um, I personally wouldn't be surprised if where Congress ends up is something very similar to the rates that we had for the soldiers and the 9-11 victims as a plausible compromise. So we're trying still to work on recommendations if tax disaster legislation is inevitable. We hope it isn't, but we fear it is. We don't know that this is the best way to do it, but we suspect it's going to be pulled out of Congress's arsenal pretty regularly now, as Rich said. And some of them, it would be in terms of the horizontal equity for all disasters, both individual and more generally geographical disasters, longer period for net operating losses, more time to replace the destroyed property, also, some wage credits, some labor, as well as capital incentives. The other thing that we would like to see is to allow the administrative process, the administrative agency, to operate. We think that they are more effective, but somewhat like Ben was saying, if Congress doesn't have a role, they will find one for themselves. And we tried to think of something that would give Congress a role without letting them do bad policy. And one thing we thought of is giving them a role in having to declare the disaster so that they would still be able to get all the PR and we did something, but it would already be done with provisions that have been vetted and tested. Another one is to allow the IRS discretions within broader ranges we think the agency could do it better, but they don't have incentives currently, and for several reasons. Rich talked about they're not having the authority. The other problem is they're not going to get a lot of blame to go back to the earlier provision if they don't act. They're not going to get a lot of credit. 
for doing activity here. It doesn't raise revenue. IRS people are judged by how much revenue they raise. So we need to do something as well to give incentives to the IRS. The other thing that we want to explore a little bit more is that the provisions that seem to make sense are when they operate as insurance against the destruction of the business infrastructure that individuals cannot privately insure against. We have some moral question issues with some private insurance. Hey, if I can get it from the government, why should I insure myself? I'll just give myself disaster relief payment as a business owner. But to the extent these are things that we cannot get private insurance for, maybe tax provisions make sense, but that's what we should test them against and make sure that that's what they're providing. So those are our initial thoughts. We think that this is something we are going to have to deal with whether we want to or not. Thank you. Um, before we open this up to questions, I wanted to make a scheduling note. We're a little bit behind, so what we'll do is push things forward by 15 minutes. So um, Professor Rossi's presentation can start at 11, and then everything else can move back. We left a little play in the schedule. And um, I also wanted to introduce Professor Zelenak, who has um, graciously agreed to take a look at the paper in advance and to offer some comments. And then we'll take a few questions and have our break. Uh, I found Rich's and, and Ellen's paper very persuasive on what I take to be their two major points, one being that most of the relief that's included in this legislation is either appropriate for everybody who so to speak, as a tree fall in their house or nobody, whether or not they're in a disaster area. And secondly, to the extent being in a, in a disaster area does make a difference that ought to be reflected in legislation, the best way to handle this is to have a, uh, an off-the-shelf set of disaster relief provisions, which Congress can then invoke, rather than having to do it from scratch each time. Um, I, I also like uh, very much the, uh, the subtle double meaning in their title, which I think is intentional, the tax disaster legislation. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have uh, four comments on, on specific issues raised by the paper. Uh, first, uh, I, I'm not as convinced as Rich that uh, the Constitution has no role to play here, because how could you have forgotten my favorite prov <laughs> My favorite provision in the entire Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, the deservedly obscure Tax Uniformity Clause. Um, <laughs> well, hang with me here. Um, <laughs> which declares that uh, all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Now, if you're not intimately familiar with this, the leading case interpreting it is uh, U.S. v. Tosinski, a 1983 Supreme Court opinion, rejecting a tax uniformity clause challenge to the Alaska, uh, excuse me, to the Crude Oil Windfall Profits Tax Act of 1980, which had an exemption from the tax for Alaska oil. And uh, people who weren't eligible for the exemption said that violates the tax uniformity clause, and therefore you have to give us the exemption too. Uh, in analyzing this, the, the court gave us the, the following framework. It says, first of all, the only time the tax uniformity clause is a problem at all is if the legislation explicitly is ex uh, draws distinctions in geographical terms. Uh, the Alaska statute, the Alaska oil exemption did that, so they had to go on to step two, uh, which is even if the legislation does draw explicitly geographical distinctions, it's okay, it doesn't violate the clause as long as it's designed to, quote, address geographically isolated problems. And they decided that Alaska oil had geographically isolated problems more expensive to extract and transport and so on. And therefore, they said it was OK. Um, but to the extent one agrees with the uh, April Schmalbeck premise um, that there is no significant difference between the situation of a person who has his house fall, uh, destroyed by a tree by a strong wind in Minnesota, and somebody who has his house destroyed by Hurricane Wilma, um, you have explicit geographical terms in this legislation. And um, the problem is not, in fact, geographically isolated if you have exactly the same problem when a tree falls in your house in Minnesota. Um, obviously, how this would come out if a challenge were, were made 
would depend on the, the level of scrutiny. If all you have to have is a rational basis for saying this is a geographically isolated problem, then the challenge would fail. If strict scrutiny was applied, the challenge would probably succeed. And if intermediate scrutiny was applied, who knows? So what's the level of scrutiny? Well, we don't know. Uh, the, the Supreme Court in Tosinski uh, never uh, sort of decided the case without telling us what the level of scrutiny was. But it, it seems to be rash, uh, stronger than rational basis, but still pretty deferential. Having said all of that, uh, my, my guess is, um, it, see, the way this would come up, by the way, there's a, it's probably impossible from a standing point of view uh, to just run into court as a busybody and say, I think you have to take away all these tax breaks for people because, um, uh, because they seem inappropriate on the, or unconstitutional on the tax uniformity clause. Uh, the way to raise it and get around the standing problem is to have a tree fall on your house in Minnesota and then come in and say, I want the same thing. Uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't take it on a contingent fee basis, uh, but I, I, don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's frivolous. So, uh, if anybody, wants, anybody has a tree fall on their house and want to raise this, I'd be happy to help you. Uh, Second point I'd make is um, uh, it, it's worthwhile, I think, to put the tax disaster relief legislation in the broader context of federal disaster relief generally. The uh, Joint Committee on Taxation estimated the revenue costs of Ketra, the, the first hurricane bill, as $6.1 billion, and Goza, the second one, is as uh, $15.8 billion. So you've got about, what's that, six, six, $22 billion altogether. Um, the... Um, the, the federal government, according to the White House, has already spent $88 billion on direct um, expenditures for Katrina relief alone. They're, they've asked for another $20 billion, and that doesn't even get into Wilna and, uh, and Rita. Um, so so um, if, if you put it in the broader context, it looks a little different. It's not as if the major federal response has been the tax. The tax has been a bit of a sideshow. Uh, and, and I think there's two lessons that might be drawn from that observation, which kind of point in opposite directions, actually. Um, lesson one is, is it might be useful to start from the assumption that the federal government has this pile of $100 billion or whatever that it's going to spend uh, with respect to Katrina, and then ask what's the best way to allocate that $100 billion between tax relief and everything else. Um, and my suspicion is if you asked it that way, most tax relief would still look pretty bad with, with two exceptions. One, the tax relief, uh, like Rich described with respect to involuntary conversions or anything extending time to do things generally probably looks pretty good. Uh, the other is that, that tax relief, which, the, the, um, which clearly is a substitute for an equivalent direct expenditure program, um, which is just put, funneled through the tax code for administrative convenience like the uh, employee retention credit probably looks OK. Um, but other than that, everything else probably does, in fact, look pretty bad. The, uh, the second point, which to some extent is in the other direction, is if we're talking about a total of $100 billion or more, and um, something which uh, they had on the slide, although I don't think Rich mentioned it, um, you get a better mileage allowance if you're driving your car around to do charitable things, if you do it with respect to Katrina relief than if you do it uh, with respect to people in Minnesota who've had houses fall on them, uh, trees fall on their houses. Um, Houses fallen, that's the Wizard of Oz, right? Um, you know, on the one hand, that's a silly provision. There's no good reason why, why you should have a different rule. On the other hand, the revenue cost is $29 million. And if it makes Congress happy to do it, you know, who are, who are we to say, you know, it's a rounding error out of $100 billion. Go ahead and do it, you know. Um, third point, uh, the, the, uh, the special problem of using uh, disasters as an excuse to provide unjustified big tax breaks for the rich uh, which uh, Ellen in particular talked about in connection with the estate tax relief under the 9-11 uh, legislation. Uh, a, a really good example of that from the last round of legislation, the hurricane relief, is there's a provision which normally if you give, if, if, if you give a lot of money to charity, you can only wipe out half of your, what would otherwise be your taxable income. So you're limited to, to deducting 50% of your, what would otherwise be your taxable income. Uh, that limitation was waived for any individual who gives money to charity from August 28, 2005 to the end of 2005. And oddly enough, 
You, you think it would say if you give it to the Red Cross or if you give it for hurricane relief. It doesn't say anything like that. Just give it to charity. Uh, so there was a story in the New York Times recently that uh, Boone Pickens gave $165 million for the benefit. Anybody see this? For, for the benefit of the Oklahoma State University athletic programs. Um, <laughs> Which, uh, which I was sort of gratified to learn was apparently more than half of what would otherwise have been his taxable income. Um, and, and he got to deduct it all. You know, how come? Hurricane relief. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that too, yeah. Um, one last point. Um, I, I, I think, contrary to, to what Rich and Ellen suggested, there, there's at least an argument uh, that, that sympathy does have a legitimate role to play in, in the tax legislative process. Uh, but what they say in their paper is, is sympathy, I'm quoting, distorts tax policy by, for example, favoring the temporarily afflicted wealthy over the permanently poor. Well, you know, I'm not here to argue for favoring the temporarily afflicted wealthy over the permanently poor. But uh, I, I think a dollop of tax legislative sympathy, sympathy for the temporarily afflicted wealthy um, might be justified by reference to the endowment effect, this is the notion that psychologically or in terms of experienced utility, it's worse to have had and lost than never to have had at all. So if, if you imagine, now, and I'm, I haven't thought through how to uh, put this into tax policy if, if it belongs there at all, but if you imagine, for example, two people, each of whom now has a house worth 600000 but one is outside the disaster area and always had a house that was worth 600000 The other, you know, yesterday had a house worth a million, and now it's worth 600000 because there's this big tree on it. Um, now, in, in some sense, they're similarly situated because they each own a house worth 600000 And yet, in terms of the endowment effect, which one would you rather be? Well, I think I'd rather be the one who always had the $600,000 house. Uh, and, and to that extent, to... to uh, from a point of view of horizontal equity, I think maybe it makes some sense to, uh, to let sympathy adjust for that difference in experienced utility, even though otherwise they look like they're similarly situated. That's it. Um, uh, the, most, the, the points are, are well taken, and uh, in particular, I guess the final draft surely will include uh, some description of the tax uniformity clause, if only to explain why we think it probably won't work. But uh, it could, and it certainly, for comprehensiveness, uh, should, uh, should be included. Uh, note that the, the leading case here, again, is one that the taxpayer lost, so uh, that, uh, but maybe uh, on grounds that are distinguishable uh, in these cases, then that's at least worth exploring. So I, I think we probably uh, will include some, some discussion of that. Um, the endowment effect, I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, the trouble is we don't generally take account of that in the tax system. There are a variety of other ways, uh, other problems in which we might, and we don't. Um, maybe we should, but it comes pretty close to the idea of, of trying to account for um, uh, uh, sort of um, utility effects that can't be monetized or can't easily be monetized. And, and since we don't have a tax system that uh, taxes people who live on Venice Beach for the beautiful sunsets they see every, every day and, and, and doesn't give a deduction for the people who live in uh, a less attractive slum area uh, near a paper mill, <laughs> Uh, we probably don't want to start down that road, um, but, um, but uh, that may be worth considering too. I'm, I'm less sure about whether we want that <laughs> in the final paper or not, but it is an interesting thought and one that had not occurred to me. Uh, I don't know if, about Ellen. Um, on the others, I, I, I think, I, th I actually, in, in the interest of time, I think I probably I think they're interesting points and uh, we, will, we will think about them. It's certainly helpful to put this in context in terms of some of the numbers that Larry had, so um, let me just let, turn it over to the... <laughs> so I was going to propose a prediction or emerging out of Ben's model, and I was going to suggest that he could cite as support for my prediction uh, April Schmalbach, fourth time in the Tivo. The prediction focused on his use of the Tivo hypothesis and the idea of people vote with their feet to exert pressure on representatives. That kind of mobility is obviously heterogeneously distributed throughout our society. And 
one thing we learned in Katrina is some people can't vote with their feet, even if the referendum concerns their very survival. Uh, <coughs> so the prediction is that the disaster relief will be distributed in a way that benefits the well off, benefits the relatively mobile and therefore influential segments of society. Um, and I, I was thinking how nice papers sort of dovetail each other, at least when, when linked in that fashion. But then I'm puzzled by, I'm puzzled by the sort of outpouring of charitable donations that you cite, which seems to me to reflect not at all the sort of self-interested conception of what disaster policy generally ought to be about, but rather suggests genuine altruistic concern on the part of even the well-off. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any speculation about what's, you may put on your public choice cynicism hat, but what's the mechanism that's causing the disconnect between these preferences that we see being expressed, genuine altruistic preferences, and then the implementation in Congress in a way that still nevertheless seems to, 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 to appeal to the, the self-interest of the wealthy. Well, one thing we could just distinguish between our elected officials and the public as a whole, part of the discussion we had before. So the charity is coming from the public as a whole, and when we go to our elected officials, they're still the ones who are most likely to vote with their feet. So the, your own explanation would give some power to that distinction. Well, we, uh, the, uh, in the paper itself, there is a little bit of a discussion about the, uh, the irony that uh, the, the many, uh, maybe most, uh, criticism of congressional action in the last generation has focused on uh, public choice theory, which is premised on a kind of uh, the defect of excessive self-interest. Here we have the opposite. And it turns out to produce bad legislation just as well as the uh, public choice does, which uh, is, is ironic. I don't know where this comes from, but it is phenomenal. Uh, it, it, is, it seems to me purely sentimental, uh, but uh, I think it can be said that uh, sentiment moves uh, mountains, or at least moves a bill through the, the legislature, uh, and uh, it's, it's overpowering. Uh, the, I, I, Ellen didn't give a lot of detail about the Red Cross example, and maybe everybody here knows it, but the, but the fact is they raised so much money that they couldn't find a reasonable way to spend it on the victims of 9-11, and so tried to, to devote it to other victims who were equally sympathetic, but who, who just hadn't been on you know, the subject of 24-hour-a-day coverage on CNN for a month, uh, and it just didn't work. They, they, the public outcry was so great that they had to figure out um, ways, but not good ways, of, uh, of, of um, lavishing the, the largesse on the, on the right victims and not the wrong victims, even though you just really couldn't make uh, reasonable distinctions. I, I don't know what, where this altruism comes from, but I it's, think partly it, it is the media coverage yeah. and the fact that we had identifiable victims. Everybody remembers the New York Times on the 9-11 day after day, and there is some work in which we can really identify with an individual victim that that makes it much more powerful to the individuals. So I think the media coverage had a lot to do with it as well. But there's no, I, I don't see a way of changing that. The media covers what it thinks people want to read about, so. Matt? In terms of the, um, the appropriate <coughs> post-disaster tax relief, I mean, isn't there a huge tension between mm -hmm. horizontal equity, which you guys focused on, and ex-ante efficiency? I mean, it's certainly true as a matter of horizontal equity, there's no difference between you know, someone whose house or tree, uh, 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 or you know, damaged by a tree in um, a hurricane, as opposed to someone whose house is damaged by a tree in a tornado or some local wind event. So hard than actually get parties for extending the relief. Um, or contracting it, by the way. Well, well, but this is a crucial point, which is that um, uh, uh, the literature on ex ante um, uh, mitigation and incentives points out that natural subsidies, right, grants <coughs> disasters have terrible moral hazard problems, mm -hmm. right? right? They induce people not to take individual mitigation measures, not to buy ex uh, insurance, ex experience rated. As, as you, you know, you see this, for example, in the very uh, low rate of ownership of, of flood insurance, of earthquake insurance, and so on. So um, the problem is, as a matter of sympathy, right, whatever reason, <coughs> we're going to have some, 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 there's going to be some response, right? Hard on equity then says, but it's not going to be none, right? Hard on equity then says, expand it, right? But in terms of the, uh, incentives going forward, that just uh, entrenches the popular view that if you're a victim of natural disaster, you're going to be bought up by the government. You're going to be made whole. And that's, you know, uh, again, as a matter of individual mitigation, that, 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 that is a bad expectation. Yeah, Saul Ledmore has an interesting paper he did a few years ago on disaster relief, and he says it's really good to not have it predictable. 
so that people will not have the moral hazard problem. And so that's part of the tension here, but horizontal equity could go the other way and say, look, you need the 10% floor for casualty losses even here in order to give you the incentive to insure privately and not depend on the government to come to your rescue. Well, that's the other point, which is that it, may, it makes a lot more sense to take it for, for this stuff to occur in the form of deduction as opposed to credit. Credit is a really bad thing, and that's you know, truly being made whole. Right, without any kind of um, <coughs> deductible, as it were, uh, on the part of the, the victim is, 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 is particularly bad in terms of enhancing. We always have the tension between equity and efficiency. It's something we struggle with all the time, and all of us do. Also, the, the, I, I think, again, in the paper, it may not have come across as well in the presentation, but in the paper, I think the tone that we've striven for is that the horizontal equity should be in the direction of uh, the background rules, which have been more carefully thought out. And we've decided that, for example, in the casualty loss area, that a 10 percent of AGI deductible does make sense for a variety of reasons, and we should stick with that. Now, you may be right that it's impossible to stick with that. Well, it, this may be a problem that's impossible to fix. We, we're not really sanguine about uh, any of the things that we've done, uh, that we've suggested in here, actually working. We hope collectively maybe they'll make some difference. Uh, but but I, 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 would, I hope that people don't read our paper as a plea for an expansion of the provisions of Ketra, Goza, et cetera, to all taxpayers everywhere who have anything that remotely resembles the things that uh, uh, those bills relieve, because uh, that's not the idea. The idea is basically Congress should exercise some self-restraint here, and, and that may be <laughs> a pipe dream. Uh, yeah, that may be hopeless. Thank you.